All right, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, IBM Quantum. I'll, give a, I'll focus on basically what uh, was said in the introduction, how we're going through what I call utility into um, what I hope that we can achieve as a community next is Quantum Advantage. So IBM has a roadmap. I'm not going to go through this roadmap in any way. Um, you can find it online. I would just like to say that we are pretty confident in the hardware um, going from our systems that we have today to our future fault-tolerant uh, machines. Uh, the direction we'll go, I heard in the introduction, uh, talking about LDPC codes. Um, our view is that, or well, our goal and our timeline is to achieve this in 2029, uh, demonstrations of machines that are using uh, fault tolerance. From um, from our perspective, of, we do not see any roadblocks uh, from the hardware. Um, in a longer talk, I'd go into much more detail about that. But this talk, I want to actually talk about something different. The first thing, um, when we start to think about how we're going to use a quantum computer, uh, the first question that we often ask is, can you actually trust the output about it? I think this is very important, and I think we've got to start to work out how we get um, rigor what I call rigorous heuristics, rigorous trust into it. So if I start with this question, uh, can we trust that qubits, uh, sorry, quantum computers can execute quantum circuits accurately? Um, last year, a paper from our team came out, and I think this paper is the first time, in my view, that we can uh, say that we trust the output of it. In this paper, what we did is we looked at the expectation value on 127 qubits, and we um, calculated properties that I would say is what we call beyond brute force simulation of those circuits. To give you an example, imagine I had a parameterization. I had 10 experiments. Um, is the clock going to work? OK, I'll just keep talking until I'm told to get off. OK, so in each one of these different experiments, um, they're all different independent, OK? And I'm going to say there's 10 different experiments. There is some parameter, we'll call it angle, and there's some quantity we measure. And if we go do these 10 experiments uh, for this experiment, every one of them produces a different curve. If you look at the data, you actually see that all of them are about uh, different, but more exciting, one of them actually comes from a quantum computer. What we called this is we called this uh, quantum utility, the point where we can do something on a quantum computer that we don't exactly know what it is. Uh, we don't, sorry, we don't exactly know how to simulate that uh, circuit accurately. And what's so exciting is all these methods are approximate methods, like tensor methods and things like this. So in my view, we're in this new regime. We're in this regime where we can start to use the quantum computer as a tool and start to ex explore how it works. And, sorry, as examples, I think um, there's many different papers where this has happened. So uh, since uh, these, these first uh, utility experiments, these papers are around up to 20 of them. So I think we can say we're at this point where we see repeated ways of doing execution on these quantum computers are giving us accuracy, accuracy, as leading to trust. So I, what my view is is we are finally in a new regime. This new regime is where the quantum computers that we have today we cannot simulate them exactly. They're starting to come up with techniques, and there'll be many of them presented uh, throughout, uh, throughout the day, where we can actually bring error bars into them and get that trust. And so now you ask the question, how are we going to transition uh, from this utility to getting quantum advantage? Uh, the view of IBM has never been that we will get quantum advantage ourselves. Uh, our view is that to achieve quantum advantage, it takes a community, it takes algorithm discovery, it takes many people working very hard on using this. And so <clears throat> today, um, many of you are, are, are members of the IBM Quantum Network. We have over 276 members worldwide. They're everything from startups to research institutes to research labs. But more important than that, it's people. It's people that want to actually do things to calculate, to work on things. Everything from um, universities at RPI, South Korea, Japan, uh, BASQ in Europe, Cleveland Clinic in America, all around the world working on this problem. 
Zooming into Japan um, from IBM Quantum's perspective, and I heard it at the start, Japan has been working with us for a very long time. Um, I think it was the first um, strategic partner that we had. And uh, that was with Keio University. It is now growing to include University of Tokyo, Riken. There is over 100 papers doing it, many different industries working with these universities. And to date, they've used something like three, three, uh, about four years of execution on, the, on these hardwares on quantum computers to look at this problem. So I'm going to jump into a couple examples, and hopefully I'll get the time soon, and, and I'll give you a flavor of how I think we're going to get from the utility to what we call advantage. So one of the papers I recent, uh, recently done by the University of uh, Washington is this one. I'm not going to go into the details of the problem, except to say, they basically come up with novel ways of mapping the problem to quantum hardware. They come up with ways of then taking rigorous approximations of the problem to remove some higher order um, interaction terms so they can come up with a simple circuit that has a, a way of creating a vacuum, a wave particle, uh, a wave packet, sorry, and then evolving it. They run it on over 100 qubits, and in this case, I think it was about 13,000 gates. So this is a very large computation on a circuit. And, what they, and then they come up with their own ways of doing some post-processing and error mitigating. And what they find is they find that they can look at properties, they can compare it to um, matrix product states, and they find even that there's the systematic differences in it. So to me, this is so exciting. It's not at a point where they, this is quantum advantage, but it's systematically different to matrix product states, and we don't know which one is the correct one. Uh, Riken uh, in Japan, uh, they did a paper where they look at this novel uh, transition of um, uh, non-equilibrium properties. So in this paper, they come up with a way of mapping it to a simple, it turns out to be pretty simple to do this mapping, executing and optimizing the circuit. They look at different regimes, and then they run it on one of our uh, latest processors. This one was a Heron, it was 133 qubits, again around 15,000 gates. And they were able to look at regimes where, say, some of the tensor methods uh, started, started to break down. And whilst they still are in a regime where you can do this exactly on the, on the, on the well, you can do this with approximate methods, they, they have their error mitigation. They show that post processing error mitigation also works. Um, they, th their conclusion is that it is actually useful uh, to study these types of properties. A, diff a completely different qu uh, direction, Modona. Um, their interest in studying um, mRNA secondary structure. So again, they come up with a way of mapping the problem. They come up with a way of executing the problem. They were able to run this on 80 qubits, still a large calculation. And they find that in this method, uh, they were able to get um, the quantum computer to reveal the right answer uh, to this problem. Uh, you'll hear later today, Q control. Another example that I think is a, a great example of a paper. Um, they look at optimization problems. They come up with a way of doing their own unique mapping, their own unique error suppression techniques, a way to execute it on a quantum computer, and a post-processing, you can call it error mitigation, to throw out results that are not exactly, that are easy to determine and not equal to the right one. And again, they're able to do it at a regime where I would call, I call it utility, where it's at 100 qubits, a few thousand gates. Of course, um, you can still do these optimization problems on classical methods, but they're pushing the limit and getting close to um, uh, the, mo the most advanced methods that are like CPLEX and things like this. So all of these have something in similar. So as we think how we're going to get towards doing this type of algorithm work, the first question we have is, I've always thought what we are building at IBM Quantum is hardware and Qiskit is our open source um, package. I'm sure many of you have used it, but I, and I can talk <laughs> a long time, but I won't. We're really focused on making it performance. But this is where I've always imagined people uh, come to do some type of work. But what I think you kind of see by these examples, as we come and we do these algorithms, you see that there's kind of this unique sort of procedure occurring. We've got to come up with novel ways of mapping novel ways of optimizing the circuit, how to be executed. Obviously, it has to execute on quantum hardware, and if it doesn't execute on quantum hardware, I think you're wasting your time to use simulators to actually go and look for 
uh, where quantum advantage is. And then finally, it's got to be some novel way of post-processing uh, the quantum computer. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and so we called this a Qiskit pattern, but you can think of this as an antinomy of an algorithm. So one of the most uh, exciting things that we are announcing is we are actually going to change the way uh, you use our quantum computers. So when we put the quantum computer on the cloud in 2016, um, I thought this it started as a way that I wanted to take it out of a research lab and bring it to everyone using a quantum computer. And I think the kind of way everyone's been using a quantum computer generates quantum circuits, executes it, they do all their stuff on the uh, classical computer. I think those days are done. I think we're actually going to change. We are calling them functions. But what we imagine is we are going to create ways where quantum computers, people can execute their software, they can create their, their own versions of um, optimization, their own versions of mapping, execute it on the hardware, and create higher level abstractions. So as we go to user applications, we're starting to get to the point where rather than execute circuits, you start to think of it as functions and this library of things that will happen. Um, we're excited that many of these that will come out will not be made by IBM. They will incorporate a lot of our partners. As I said, we have over 280 members. I'm very excited in bringing their innovation to our platform and working out how we can do. So stay tuned. This will come out this year. I think it will be as big as when we put the quantum computer on the cloud. I'm actually hoping it'll be bigger, but I'm hoping it starts to show that quantum computing can be looked at in a different way. So in the last few minutes, well, sorry, th then on this slide, as I said, Qiskit plus QPUs equal work. And if we're going to get to useful work, I actually think it's going to be Qiskit plus our QPUs plus all this application software that has been created to really get that uh, message um, that I made uh, home. So now I want to change topics. Um, but it's related. We often say we're also working towards a concept we call quantum-centric supercomputing. When I say quantum-centric supercomputing, I don't just mean a quantum computer. I actually don't just mean a bigger quantum computer. I actually mean a new architecture that puts QPUs, uh, CPUs, GPUs all working together. And I know that lots of people are saying HPC plus quantum, and we've always been working on it. But you can think of that pattern going to the next level. So like all those four steps, now I imagine you may want to use lots of parallel compute for the mapping, lots of parallel compute for the optimization, execute over many different quantum processors. So you could imagine having many quantum computers in there. Do lots of post-processing. So you see you get this sort of next level of sort of creating this way of working a lot of classical compute with a quantum computer. As an example, I throw this up. So if you um, take an interesting chemistry problem, uh, Fe4, S4, it has 72 qubits. Obviously, it's being used as many examples in a fault-tolerant example. There's lots of papers of how long it would take to execute this problem. A lot of people, if you were to go and say, I have to measure 6.71 of those pulleys, and you calculate, well, if I take the VQE algorithm or the near-term proposal, and I go measure every term, it would take you 3 million years just to execute this, assuming basically a rep rate of 10 microseconds. And this is why speed of these, these matter. But what we can do is if we can think of novel new algorithms that can mix classical and quantum, this actually comes down to something that is possible. So the team at IBM with Rikin, University of Bo um, Colorado Boulder, don't have time to go into the details of this, but they essentially took a quantum computer, the Her uh, latest Heron processor, a Fugaku, um, which was talked about before, the supercomputer done in Japan, and they essentially use a quantum computer to approximately diagnose the answer, so get to the halfway, feed that information into Fugaku to do the rest of the problem, so creating that loop and to, and to diagnose the problem. So it's kind of, you can think of it as doing perturbation theory with a quantum computer and then doing the rest of the diagonalization uh, with the supercomputer. And it fits exactly into these steps. You have a way of mapping, optimizing, executing, and then you have this complicated post-processing uh, sort of way that is, a, uh, that is occurring using the Fugaku. And of course, the results. Um, in my opinion, these are some of the largest chemistry results. 
Uh, we're not at the point of getting quantum advantage, and no one is uh, claiming that. They're at a size that are beyond brute force simulating of these quantum circuits, but we're getting results run on a quantum computer that are getting close, well, if you look in the middle one, actually pretty much consistent with DMRG and other classical methods. So I think it's exciting that by using this different architecture, we can get up here and start to say, we can do advanced chem chemistry calculations on quantum computers and compare with the leading approximate classical methods and get results that are close. Going into the details of the results, if we make improvements in the noise, actually make the thing iterative, uh, it suggests ways that we can go forward. And this is one of the things that we're working on with many of our partners, is exactly that. Let's take a quantum computer and put it next to a large HPC. So taking with our um, colleagues in RPI, university in, um, in America, just up at the Hudson, uh, they have one of the largest sort of classical su supercomputers for a uh, university. It's eight petaflops, and we have a good way of connecting between them, so we can start to explore this. Of course, with, um, as I said, with our colleagues at uh, Rikin, we're putting one uh, next year next to Fugaku, and we want to extend and explore this type of algorithm. We're also so confident about this type of algorithm and this way of doing computation that we are also working uh, with, in this case, Pascal, to make sure that when a quantum computer is put inside this new model, this new way of doing quantum-centric supercomputing, it is not locked to one type of hardware. This has always been our uh, philosophy with Qiskit to make sure it's uh, agnostic to the hardware, and we're taking this forward into how we do quantum-centric uh, supercomputing. So in my view, we're close to getting to uh, quantum advantage. I only have three minutes left for questions, but I think it's going to be a combination of two things. The creation of the, the IP created in novel ways of doing everyone's own uh, versions of mapping, optimization, error suppression, and error correction, as well as bringing classical and quantum computers together, combined with how we're going with the hardware roadmap, I do think quantum advantage will be achieved in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. We are a little bit behind schedule, but we have time for one uh, question. So we have one uh, question on Slido. Please um, use the Slido uh, uh, function to ask questions again. And if not, there are these exhibitions uh, right next door where some of uh, um, uh, the uh, presenters will also be available to, um, and their company uh, staff will be available to answer any questions. But uh, we'll take one question, and that is, will Qiskit functions help create more quantum startups? I think um, the short answer is yes, but I think the better answer is, can we actually start to enable startups so that we can create an industry where multiple people start to make money? And Qiskit Functions is the first step along that path. <laughs>